I think I'll go through territory that is known to you. That means we will focus a little bit on human development, but also I'll demonstrate in practice how uh, human development is, is truly what you can call heterodox, or it's a tru truly multi, you wouldn't say methodological, you, you multiple disciplinary approach. And also, you'll be hearing several times during the lecture that the concept that we take an interest in human development means by implication that we also take interest in what goes on in the real world. And that means inherently it's a call for action. And that means that I will demonstrate a little bit how it goes. Now that it is a lecture, I will also towards the end put ourselves down a little bit. That means there's a certain limit to any argument and I will discuss the limitations to the argument I'm going to present. And then I hope we can take it from there. So, first and foremost, um, I will be focusing now for the purposes of this lecture on what you will call Eastern Europe and the CIS. That's going to be my geographical focus. I'm not saying that some of the arguments I'm going to present are not relevant for other parts of the world, but it's just when I looked at it from a data point of view, etc., that's, that's where I thought we should go. I also will use data uh, where it helps uh, make the argument, and that means that you should be a little bit critical and always try to look also which data I didn't use. And, and so I am openly saying here that this is not a, a, a broad-based theoretical lecture. It's a lecture where you try to make an argument and sustain the argument with, uh, with, with data. I also am trying to look both on a short term and a medium term. And I define medium term typically three to five years. So that would be my time horizon. And the argument is very much um, couched in today. So that means that one had maybe three years ago, actually, this argument would probably have been less relevant. And maybe 10 years from now, it is less relevant. But it's very much focused on the situation as we see it today. And then finally, I'm going to illustrate uh, action through the concept of green jobs. I'll talk a little bit what it means, but also that this is the focus of the call for action. Let us just step back. We have heard a lot of the economic crisis. We have heard of financial crisis. But fundamentally, everything we read and everything we see focuses on what I call GDP. That means most discussions are about economic efficiency. And the bad news is, poor people actually do not fare very well with economic efficiency. There's a tension there. Economic efficiency will always try, you know, get the banking sector right, get certain things doing, going, and then let's get the growth back, etc., and then we're fine. But that focuses very much on the DGP side of the argument. We are more interested in the human development side of the argument. And that is, are we sure, and how can we be sure, that what we do really help people to achieve a better life? Or you can be more formal about the definition and get into fulfilling or you know, realizing full potential. I do think in the human development concept sits some qualitative uh, dimensions. And it is that the development that you go forward is inclusive. That everybody has a right to participate in that development <coughs> as you move forward. I also think that for a human being, it's very important that the individual is recognized. Recognition matters. Issues like human respect matters. And then, increasingly, the concept of sustainability matters. And you will see that theme coming up again and again and again. The basic hypothesis is that the financial crisis has spilled over, or is spilling over, into a severe negative impact on the real economy. And as the real economy goes, negative human development goes down. Can I prove this? No. We can read the certain statistics now, but actually statistic lacks a little bit. So the full consequences of human development cannot be proven. And that you will hear again and again and again will, will actually be a call for not doing anything. And, and for us, this is very important, that we focus and try to reasonably predict with what we know what is happening and then act now. If we only act when we can surely show 
that the human development has been super negatively affected, it is most likely too late. That means that if you are to affect very complex systems, you have to act in a very timely manner. What I'm trying to get us to is a set of, it's an argument, also a set of data that will allow us to act. And that means I'll make the argument that human development and our study of human development is an attempt to try to get to what I call actionable knowledge. Knowledge that you can actually act on. So, we believe that human development, the threat can be reversed. It can maybe even be reproved, improved. And the other point is, as mentioned, that human development is multidisciplinary. And that means that we will use a, a set of, of, of different methodologies to try to get to, to the point. Human development also is couched in complexity. And we know it from our private lives, but we also know it by studying society, that it is actually very complex. Now, for those of you who are familiar with systemic theory or system theory, it's very important if you are to affect a system, you have to find the right entry point. In systemic theory, it's called the leverage point. If you can find one point in a system, you can really make that system start behaving in certain ways. And finding that point takes a willingness to study complexity, and also finding that point is a willingness to not insist on knowing all causal links. So you do not necessarily insist to be linear. You just think thoughtfully about the system, and then you try to find a point and then leverage it. We need to seek out key relations and then understand how they dynamically connect. And this is where the human brain comes in. So very often the human brain and a group of people can actually do that more effectively than economic models or linear models in different ways. We'll draw on economics, political science and also some environmental science in what we do. So that was a bit about the background and the methodology. Let's get to the crisis. What is it exactly that links the economic crisis to human development? There are many, but I've selected three that uh, it is, is very important. On the assumption that the macroeconomic side of the economic crisis is being addressed, which it is, you can read the paper, and IMF is flying around everywhere, etc. then the key transmitter in this region for declining human development is gainful employment. It's not employment, because some parts of this region here, employment, you can actually work a lot, but you have a little return. So we use the term gainful employment. If people have access to gainful employment, a lot of other things in their lives will go the right way. There are two other main avenues right now that will affect human development significantly, and that is, number one, access to cash transfer. It's better known as social systems. Those who have can protect themselves that way. Those who can stay in these systems can do it. But there are many who do not have access or temporarily have access and then they get pushed off. Finally, basic access to education and health still matters. And in many of the countries we cover, this is a function also whether you're gainfully employed. Now, the interesting thing about those parameters is, if you think about it right now, and the, you look at the macroeconomic picture, you see that the tax base of all the countries in our region is being more narrow. And as the tax base goes down, so does the state's ability to finance uh, cash transfer, health and education. So we predict that this, these contagion or avenues of contagion, they will grow worse, not better. And also, in a number of countries which have very formal, for example, unemployment systems, people will only be on unemployment benefit for a, a limited period of time. After that period of time, they're pushed off to a social system. And maybe at the time that happens, the social system does not have much more cash left. So, how bad is it? Let's get to one indicator which is good. And this is GDP. And here, if you look, we put 2007, 2008, and 2009. And on these, which are the latest uh, from the World Bank, 
Ukraine takes the price and will have probably minus 8% GDP. Russia minus 6, Armenia minus 5. Last time we looked at the same figures, they were a little smaller. And I'm not even sure that once we get through 2009 that these figures will hold. These figures could maybe later read 10, 8, etc., etc., etc. These are dramatic drops. And behind these figures sits a shrinking tax base, rapidly incre increasing unemployment, and there can maybe even be shocks to these economies that we cannot fully predict uh, uh, what, what will happen. You can see also Moldova sits here with minus 3.4, but I personally think this is understated. That means that this will go up. So this is one thing that we know. But let me show you another one that also gives you a sense of when will the crisis go away. Because we have a sense that our GDP, you know, it can be turned around, which is true. And you read in, in the newspaper that maybe the crisis is over in, 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 in the US and GDP will increase and then we're moving forward. Mm -hmm. That's true. But there's another problem that you have to deal with as a country. And that is that one thing is what happens to your GDP, but you also have a huge external debt. And some of the countries that sit here, Romania, Lithuania, former Republic of uh, yeah, Macedonia, Moldova, Georgia, they have huge refinancing, short-term refinancing. And of course what happens is that right now they're getting more money in from IMF, from the World Bank, God knows what, and these are all loan money. This money has to be paid back. So therefore, what happens is that the external balances come under significant pressure. And behind that can sit an argument that says the recovery is not going to be that fast. Because once you get your GDP going down, you get people pushed out of work, you get a lot of other people hurt by the thing, and then you start having these kind of refinancing requirements that are rapidly growing you will have to constrain your own economy for, for the medium term in order to pay back some of this stuff here. And that means that we will go fast down and there's a long way up. We have to think of human development not in terms of a GDP turnaround, but a much more complex way of thinking. How do we bring most of the people back to a position where they can live fully fulfilling lives and realize their potential? There are many other ways of making this argument, but I just wanted to, to, to show this to you. The two countries here that have very little financing, you know why? Any guess? Azerbaijan, what do they have lots of? Oh, yes. Yes. Gas. And our friends here also, they have less gas, but they have a good price with Russia. So, uh, so they're fine. Okay, but social systems. This slide here talks about social protection as a percentage of GDP and then poor covered, the number of poor covered. And you can see that <clears throat> a number of the countries, let's say if you put it here like 40%, which is this axis, a lot of countries, they lie below the 40%. That means 40% of the population is covered by former social systems. Now, if they get pushed out of having access to gainful employment, where do they go? God knows where. That means that they will go back, try to do something in agriculture, or go into the informal sector and the urban sector and see what, what they can do. And the other thing is that this is a percentage of GDP. Now, what happens when GDP goes down? Either you try to maintain your social service, and then that means the percentage gets pushed up, which is not very likely because the tax base is going down, and the alternative is that the absolute amount of the coverage goes down. And this is most likely what's going to happen. That means that social coverage will maybe stay, but what people actually get will go down. And there can be different mechanisms. In Ukraine, for example, if you devalue your currency with 60-70%, I mean, you remove a lot of purchasing power out of that currency. So even though you get the same social transfer, your purchasing power for that transfer has gone down. In, as some of your 
purchasing will have some external content. So without, I mean, just trying to indicate the issue here is we have a situation where we can see GDP is going down and we still don't know where it will, it will stop. We can only say the last four or five times, every time I ask the World Bank to publish the latest, the trend is clear, it's going this way. At the same time, it will not continue to go down. It will one day bottom out for sure. We do know that refinancing is there, and this is maybe not so much talked about, but in development terms, refinancing is for real. And this is right now going the wrong way, for sure. Social systems, we can see they exist. We can also see they're very fragile. They cover often 40% of those who are poor, maybe 50 on a good day. They are being weakened, and that means these systems cannot really help a, a large groups. And that means I think it's safe to conclude that exclusion will go up. That means people will be excluded from the labor market or excluded from more formal systems. And they will have to try to find a way forward themselves, maybe through informal, maybe through migration. So the picture is that some countries are in trouble and we should try to see what we can do there. The argument plays out best in these countries, but as I said, it may have application more broadly. For the sake of argument, if you pick Armenia, Moldova, and Ukraine, you will for sure find countries that are in severe trouble from a human development point of view, let alone from an economic point of view. So, the argument is, if we are to help people, give them some jobs. Jobs is kind of the key leverage point. If you give a person a job with a recent wage, over time, it will work. It's not perfect, it will work. So the argument is this. Find some money, maybe development assistance. The more money you have, the more jobs you create. It's a simple argument. And in a way, this lecture could stop here. But it's not going to, because there's a problem here. We need to be a little more careful about Jens what do you mean jobs? What do you mean jobs? Because if you just find some money and give your job, that job is temporary. Does that job contribute to anything? Future development, for example. And if I ask you, and I'll show it, if I ask you just to go and dig a hole and fill it again, it is a job, but it actually does very little to you. So the way to fix that and maybe drive a little more future investment and a little more sustainability into creating jobs is to introduce a capital element. That means it is you plus some money. That means that you don't dig a hole or, or sweep a street, but you actually do something meaningful with the money. So we, we find some capital and we, we give you a job and then we attach the capital, either you get a little machine or you do something, and then that job maybe may lead to something. But that has a problem, because we're in a downturn. So therefore, if I attach you to maybe a little shop or a little business, how do I know that this is financially viable? Many, 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 many small and medium and even large companies, they're collapsed, because economically they're not viable. So just by introducing a capital element, I'm not done yet. I'm not really getting you to the right kind of jobs that we need to create here. So finally, if we said to create jobs, I have argued the financial crisis is it, then we can get through, GDP will rise, I kept everybody employed, or many, we kept them employed, and we get back to normal, and we get back from the crisis, and then we're all fine. The problem with that argument is that we're not fine. There's one dimension we forgot. And that is behind us. And over the last 10, 15 years, there has been a slow moving climate crisis. And what has happened is that it is coming right behind us. And, and right now, if we don't deal with that issue, it will create problems for us just on the other side of the financial crisis. When I say it's slowly moving, that means that, I don't know, but you have this idea of the CO2, 
there is a final um, stock that the Earth can take, and we have been filling that stock for the last hundred years. And of course, like when you're lying in the bathtub, when you're filling it with water, it's not the first 30 centimeters or 40 centimeters that's a problem. It's the last five centimeters that's a problem where it spills over to the floor. And we are getting into that area now. And that's why this issue is becoming a real problem. Okay? And the other thing is it has been slowly coming. And that also means like systems, if you don't stop it now, that means if we don't do something now, we can't stop the flow inflow. And if we can't stop the inflow, it will spill over 10, 15, 20 years from now. And this is the problem. So while we're having a financial crisis, we have to deal with another crisis. If not, then we will have some fairly happy years trying to fix employment problems, while our children and even yourself in old age, you will have enormous amount of problems. I mean serious problems. Okay? And that means that we are violating the basic tenets of human development. We have to think about living, realizing full potential and fulfilling lives. And that means inherently we as human beings want to know that we leave the planet for our children also. It sits in the logic. And that means we have to focus a little bit on the climate crisis. So if you go with me, let's divert away from human development and employment to the climate crisis. What is this saying? Here we started in 1856, that's when we start measuring stuff, and now we are in 2004. First of all, it says the temperature average worldwide has nearly increased one degree. Secondly, it says, and this is the bathtub, we have been filling from 275 CO2 units up to 375. And that's what we have been doing the last Mm, not 150, 140 years, roughly. And what is probably more dramatic, this is why we have been filling it. These are our CO2 emissions. And as you heard before, UNDP, along with the rest of the UN, recommends that the temperature should not go above 2 degrees. If it does, we believe that it will create severe adaptation problems and other problems, and that means we will have problems. So, how much time do we have? This one is a complex slide, but I'll walk you through it. There are seven scenarios, and the top scenario is do nothing scenario. If we do nothing, and here is the cutoff point. If you go above run, roughly 1,500 gigatons total bathtub, the Earth will increase more than 2 degrees. If we do nothing, in 2032, we'll put ourselves on a trajectory where we will go up and, and triple it in, before 2100. It is totally unknown what happens in that territory, and it has never happened in the history of this Earth that we have been there. Then we have different scenarios, but only scenario 5, 6, and 7 are the scenarios where we start doing something. That means doing mitigation, and mitigation means cut CO2 emissions. And scenario 7 is the so-called preferred scenario, and it means if we are here, which is 2009, we have to do a lot to break the trend that is bringing us this way and try to get this way. And for every year we don't do anything, which was also this year, we didn't do enough, so we're still growing. For every year we don't do anything, the more likely is that we start doing like this. And whether we cut through 2032 or 2042 depends a little bit, but it will be one of those two years. So, on the short term, we have an economic crisis, on the short term, we have a huge employment problem in this region. And employment is a very important thing to do. On the slightly longer term, we have this problem. But the problem is with us today, because if we don't act, something will go wrong 20 years from now. And the less you also understand, if you, if you only start acting here, you cannot achieve this kind of stuff. You will, you will overshoot. And as I said, this is a systemic argument. Once we overshoot, 
we actually do not fully understand what will happen, except that it will go very bad. So, the argument is to bring us back to work, is we take the capital component of jobs and then we invest them in a different way. We can be building a bridge, that's very good. That creates a lot of work for sure. If you build a huge bridge, it creates work. We can also buy a machine. I can get you into food processing. You get a little loan from me and you move into food processing somewhere. And, uh, and that's very good. I can also get you to insert well-insulated windows. That's the capital cost here is the cost of the windows. And then I can ask you to clean city streets. And that was the first one. It has no capital component. I can get you out there, the city, uh, you know, sweep the streets, and I create a lot of employment, but I don't have very big capital component. So what you can see a couple of things is, there is a trade-off between the capital component and job creations. If I let everything go to salary and nothing to capital, we, we clean the streets. Probably inversely, if I build a bridge, they are very expensive. So while they create a lot of jobs, they also cost a lot of money. This is not a scientific slide. That means I'm just trying to illustrate certain things. Don't, you know, the windows could have been here or there, it's not that, but it's just the concept of the, of the argument. So then let us run a little benefit on this stuff here. And the way I looked at it was, we have established the cost re relations between wage and capital. So then I said, let's focus a little bit on the benefits. So I do clean the streets. The benefit is that it creates short-term income, it creates taxation basis, and we get the clean streets. That's what we get. It has no long-term benefits. The minute I stop cleaning the streets program, you're done. Maybe I kept you employable. That means that you were never really unemployed, and that's a very good thing. That's very positive. I can also get you to insert windows. Then you do get the income, like with the first job, but then suddenly the family that owns the house that you did it for they pay less in energy bill. So now it has a net income impact on them. It increases the value of the building. It reduced import because most countries here import energy and in the case of all of the Armenia, yeah, they import. But if you're exporting, you can just, instead of using it at home, you can export more. So the argument works. But interesting enough, if you fix the window, you start mitigating climate change because you reduce CO2 emissions. There are some weaknesses in the argument if you have nuclear power and all that. But by and large, the argument holds true. And certainly, if we focus on Armenia, Moldova, and Ukraine, it certainly holds true. Now, there's another benefit, and that is resilience. I don't know where I, I, you're I know you're from the region, but last year when Ukraine and Russia, they had a little discussion about uh, who should pay for the gas, certain countries became very cold. And, and the more you do some kind of you know, create better insulated houses and all that, everything else being equal, your society can better survive crises like this. And then finally, the people who live in the place have a better living. Now, long term, you have the same. But then let's go down. Food processing, it does the same. You get this employment. You reduce import because it's better for you to do the food processing at home. So there's a good impact there. And there's also an increased resilience because you're not that dependent on other things. The problem is this is climate change neutral. So there are good short term and also some good longer term. Fundamentally, if you build a bridge, it, it, it gives the employment and the uh, uh, you know, tax payment kind of benefit. And longer term, it of course gives reduced time, cost, I mean, the, the benefits of increased infrastructure. But it has a negative climate change under current prevailing economic uh, use of cars, et cetera, et cetera. It has a negative climate change impact. But this is not enough because we also have to think about the risks. If I do a clean city street program, no risk. Easy to organize, get it done. If I insert the windows, it's very interesting, it's low risk. And that we compare to the food processing. It is because if I get you to do food processing, I'm not sure you have a market to sell in. This is the problem today. If you do a new business in Armenia, 
you're not 100% sure that you know that this is a sustainable practice. That means whether there's market for your customers. However, the energy market has not collapsed. Does any of you know what the oil price is today per barrel? It used to, recently used to be like all the way to 40, what do you say? 25. Exactly. So at the time, in the beginning of the crisis, it dropped, so everybody said energy will go down. But immediately, it has knocked back up. So now it's up to 75. Okay. The energy price market has not collapsed. And because of the crisis, most countries are removing their subsidies to energy. So therefore, the energy market is safe. So if I get a window installed, the impact of that is going to be there, and I don't have any market risk. And the low risk, uh, the also risk against my low, sorry, future, risk against my future benefits are low when I insert the windows. It will for sure help the, the crisis, etc. If you go to the bridge, you can build the bridge, that is known. It will for sure give you employment. And this is happening a lot in the US and elsewhere. The problem is, they are too high risk. In an economic downturn, which takes many years to recover, the return on that bridge may actually not be that strong. And we do see bridges being built with very little traffic on them. Okay? And secondly, there's a very high risk that this will accelerate greenhouse gas emissions. You can say, well, if we start having electrical cars and all that, the answer to this is, is it will not happen, which I agree with. But right now, with the prevailing economic structure, and you look three to 10 years ahead of you, a good bridge somewhere will for sure accelerate greenhouse gas emissions. So all this, from an intervention point of view, inserting the windows, fixing the pipes, insulating the walls, putting a new thermostat on your boiler, all these things are the kind of jobs that will get us to where we need to go in the short term and that addresses the climate change head on. And at the same time, from a market point of view, they're low risk because the return, because the energy market has not collapsed, the return is clear. Well, if you follow me so far, you may say, okay, we're getting there. Maybe we should go for this thing here. But you have heard Obama mentioning green jobs. We have heard these green jobs being heard. So uh, how come that uh, it's just not being done everywhere? It's such a persuasive argument, so it should be implemented. So there, there are reasons why. And the main reason, there are several, but the main reason is the price of energy, as you know it today, is wrong. It is flatly wrong. And this is, among other things, why we're not going where we are going. There are a number of other reasons, that is, a number of countries, also in this region, they're not sure that the climate crisis is real. I have been, in my UNDP capacity, talking to very senior level officials who will tell me that generally they believe, for example, that coal is not so good, but the coal produced in their country is fantastic. Okay? So you, are, you still have these kind of arguments coming out. Okay? Then there are two very practical arguments. And this is doing these green jobs is actually not the, the, the organizing and really understanding how to do it is not so well known. Uh, fixing up buildings, schools, trying to do energy audits, et cetera, et cetera. They're relatively new things. They have been around maybe for five, seven years in our part of the world. So there's not really a lot of knowledge on how to do it, but the knowledge is coming now. And then finally, and this you can see from, from, the, uh, from what I've shown you, we do not fully know today the employment impact of what we do. Because let's say you buy my argument and say, let's go insert windows. It would be natural to say, if I had a million dollars, how many jobs could I in get and how many windows could I insert? That's not known. That figure doesn't exist. We are desperately trying to find that figure. And I think if I make the same lecture six months from now, I would have the figure. But today, I do not have the figure. I have the technical solutions, for sure. Those are known. I know how much CO2 they save. That's also known. But I do not know the employment impact. So let's get back to this main reason. Why is the price of energy flatly wrong? It's because. 
P1 is the price. It consists of the price for, for example, gasoline, which is demand and supply. But then we have LC. This is a loan from our children. We are borrowing from the future generation right now. Okay? And by, by doing it that way, it doesn't feel so bad. But once the bathtub is full and major problems come on, then it's because the earth will come and, and get what we owe it. Okay? So right now, the externality that sits in greenhouse gases and other things, I have tried to, to be a little more radical and say this is a loan from our children. This is how we do it. And that's why the price is wrong. The price should be uh, price two, which is this price plus the externality of, of using black or brown energy. That's what the right price should be. Now, then you would say, well, fine, if we buy your argument, what is the price for this externality? Again, that price is not fully known because we don't have a carbon market and we don't know for sure our consequences 100 years ahead. But right now, broadly speaking, in this region, the decision has been made that because we don't know what this price is, then we don't charge at all. And that is wrong. Okay? Even if you don't know for sure what something is, but you know it's not zero, then you make sure it's not zero. <laughs> okay? And this is where the big problem is. So, where, so one of the key takes away from this argument is that, for example, subsidies into energy today is absolutely no-no. Because not, they make this much bigger. They may create an incentive to burn even more energy, etc. And they prevent us from getting to the right solution, so to speak. We're nearly there, but we're not there yet. If you follow me in the line of argument saying that there is an economic crisis, employment really matters, and that is the leverage point in the system. And if you buy the argument, let's take a little time to think about what kind of employment we're really arguing. Then you can make the argument that high quality employment, the employment where you know what you do today is also worth something 20 years from now. That's the kind of employment we should focus on if we use development assistance or kind of public money. Part of that argument is also that if I get you to work on windows and boilers and solar energy and all that, 20 years from now, you will also have a job. If I get you to do manufacturing, 20 years from now, you will not be in that job. And, and so if you get people on, on a low carbon trajectory, you kind of push them to the future. So this is fine. But there are limitations to this argument. And I would like to share with you uh, some of them. First of all, the benefit side is understated. And that means that if you focus on employment and you really get it going and people out there putting in the windows and all that, from a psychological point of view, they will feel good. Being employed, doing something meaningful is much, much, much better than being unemployed. I haven't found a way of capturing that, but, but it is there. But the other problem on the negative side is that this kind of approach cannot help a lot of people who need help. People with disabilities, people who are old, people who are young, children, so this argument has its limitations, and that means it can be used for certain things, but it can certainly not address other things. Okay? Also, it is not clear if you are dynamic over time. Let's say, yeah, but let's do it. There's a finite number of how many wind windows you can replace. So you know it will only work in, in, a, in a particular period of time, and it cannot be kind of sustained. And then also the kind of development money that needs to underpin this and will underpin it in many ways, they come from somewhere. So the opportunity cost of doing one thing instead of not doing something else creates a problem. Okay? And I've tried to capture the last point by taking the different kind of job creations, but it's a limitation to the argument. So I just wanted to share with you that this argument does have limitations. So in closing, let me say three or four things. First of all, we are interested in human development because we are interested in acting. A human development focus is an implicit argument of saying human development can be improved and we should do something. Today, there's a number of countries in trouble and people are denied living fulfilling lives 
We can see where those countries are. Inside a lot of other countries, there are big groups of people who are also in trouble. And most likely, this kind of argument is also relevant for them. However, the same number of countries, and that means all of us, we are also under direct threat from a climate, climate crisis. We don't feel it yet because we can't measure it. But we have to use and listen to the science, and we have to understand that in economics, there's something called stock and there's something called flow. And stock is the bathtub, and the bathtub is nearly full. And the minute it spills over, that's when the trouble starts. We can see it, we can measure it, and this bathtub is being filled up as we speak. Gainful employment with focus on energy efficiency and renewable energy is probably the best line of action for the segment of the population that is employable. It takes care of short-term issues and it takes care of long-term issues. And it has a positive impact on every balance that matters in economics. That is the local level benefit from salary. It is the receiving family paying less heat and it is the macroeconomic balance, importing less energy or being able to export more. So, and finally, it will be better not only for this line of action, which is important, but it will also be better for our children if we could get the price of energy right, or at least get it a little bit better than it is right now. So on that note, I want to stop my, the lecturing part of, of our interaction here, and then uh, shift over to questions, answers, views, etc. Thank you very much. Starting with you. So, um, is, uh, here's the question. Is this part, I mean, so there's no way to um, kind of predict any kind of relationship between risks, benefits, and environment in terms of jobs. Am I correct? So you cannot say, okay, if we have a low risk job, it will be, you know, it will have a positive impact on the environment. You cannot no, say that, right? Let, let me see if I can. I think you can. The, the argument that I try to make here is that it comes from this basic premise in the, in the argument is we need to act. The problem is always when you act, you have to think about how risky, how, how sure am I that what I predict will happen will really happen. And therefore, I try to run these risks against the benefits and say, how, how sure am I, am I on these mm -hmm. benefits? And the problem is that the market one, the one where I get, you, I, I, I get you into the labor market doing some production or manufacturing, this is normally how I would do it. But right now, I'm in such a severe economic crisis, so I cannot predict that you are marketable. That means that beyond when my subsidy stops, then you are out of the street. If this risk is very high, which I really believe it is, then it becomes very similar to cleaning the streets that I get you to do certain things the minute I stop paying you out again. So I have to run a risk analysis and say, do you think that those risks will, will be sustained? That's how I make the link. You're right, in this analysis here, there's not a direct link at climate change, et cetera, et cetera. This was just a risk analysis on the benefits themselves. Okay. Does this help? Uh huh. Thank you. And that, so just like two more quick questions. First, could you give examples of any green jobs yeah. ex, uh, besides, you know, kind of like cleaning streets and food processing that would have a positive impact on the environment and have low risks? And yeah. then this, uh, one more question. When you create jobs during the financial crisis, where do you actually get money to pay those people? I can share with you our thinking about it. And then also, where you get the, 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 the greed jobs from, I have focused a lot on energy efficiency. And this is because in this region, it's particularly relevant. It's something to do with that most of this region have houses built in, in two or three waves. In the former Soviet Union in particular, it's, it's the, the separating years, actually early 60s. And so anything that reduces your energy bill or your energy consumption or turns you into an energy producer is a green job. But you would also have other green jobs, which I have not discussed so much. One obvious one is planting trees. If you plant trees, you capture carbon and you create an asset. And there's also a set of green jobs that sits around renewable when you use biofuel and things like this. 
and they have different impact. If you do, if you are in a sector where typically urban, where you are, your situation is your construction sectors hit very hard, then you do the kind of green jobs that I described, put in windows, replace the pipes, put in the new boiler, put thermostats on various things. Because this will go for construction workers and they will do it. If you are more in, in, in a depressed area where a factory closes and you think it will never open again, you can, for example, do uh, biofuel where, you, where they harvest from the forest because not only do you pay for the installation, but every day somebody needs to go and fill that stuff. So it creates continuous employment. So you can play with it that way. So these are the kind of green jobs that I can think of. How do we finance them? There are a number of financing sources today available and there is a lot more coming. Right now, the biggest finance of green job is called something called Global Environmental Facility. And then also is the private sector. Even today, people who can afford it, they will go and borrow in the bank, get their house fixed up with new windows and pay less for energy. The problem is that in a period like we right now, what do the banks do? They're closed. So therefore, what we have to do is we have to go and find some public money. And that can be development assistance, or it can be more sophisticated financing models where you go and find a guarantee to a bank. So you give the bank a guarantee, and then the bank says, well, if my risk is zero, I have the cash, so then I'm ready to do it. And then what will happen post-Copenhagen is that a new number of new climate change-oriented funds are coming on stream. And one of them, I, we don't know exactly what they would be called, but some of them will be financed by taxation. For example, taxation on air fuel, taxation on heavy fuel for ships, things like this. So these are some of the revenue streams that will be coming on, on, uh, on stream. Uh, and I think what you will see in reality is going to be a mix of private sector, public, international, and national. But my argument is very important is that if you are going to make employment, probably try to focus on the windows, not cleaning the streets, and not doing the food processing, because that's the safest. Please. We have uh, income generation components where we work with low-income farmers and um, we call them dekhkans. Uh, it means uh, they own small land plots and uh, they work in the agricultural sector. What we do is we um, have water uh, resource management schemes. We introduce drip irrigation in agricultural sector, which means what? Uh, we, uh, we don't buy the equipment. We just have study tours, exchange of experience, and we help the farmers find some sources of microfinancing, like the Global Environment Fund and other development assistance, where they, where they can buy this drip irrigation and manage uh, their water resource management. And it creates income, it creates new jobs, it is environment friendly, it, it, uh, it adds to the management of water resources, so it's, it's a good initiative and it's something that uh, a low income uh, population can do. It's not something big where you have to buy the uh, equipment, tractor, something complex. It's very downstream, low, and it's something that can be replicated along the, the communities which, are, which can also benefit from it. So. Just to put a nuance to what you mentioned, you see what happened is when you do better irrigation, you're slowly moving into a different kind of um, green jobs. Fundamentally, the crisis, take that. As I demonstrated with the slides, it's already happening. So this discussion has not happened, it is. But therefore, you need to do two things. You need to focus on, oh, sorry. Adaptation, and you need to focus on mitigation. Mitigation is to stop the greenhouse gases, primarily, and reverse the flow, get the flow so your stock goes down. But the example that was given here is more sitting in the adaptation side of things. Central Asia, for example, right now is officially a hotspot because of diminishing water resources. It actually rains more 
Well, because the temperature goes up, evaporation goes up. So the net result is less rain. And many countries locally will experience dramatic changes in their climate. Some will get more rain, some will get less rain. And for example, being able to shift your irrigation around so you suddenly can live with less, less water is, is an enormous important part of the adaptation. Finally, in that argument also sits the reason why it's so dangerous. To adapt costs money. Okay, who has money? The rich. Who do not have money? The poor. So who do you think is going to hurt from an adaptation point of view? It's obviously those who are on the margins of society. They're, they're the one who will hurt the most. And that means from a human development point of view, we have to take a huge interest in this. Okay, one more question, and, and that's, I mean, probably just the language issue, but looking at the word adaptation, mm -hmm. you, at least, you know, I get perception that it's something, I mean, it's not a proactive action. You kind of wait for the things to happen, and then you react. But before, you made an argument uh, that, you know, if you wait too long, it's going to be too late. So do you use the word adaptation on purpose? Is this the term that's actually used? Or, um, I mean, is there any better term to kind of define that particular, you know, concept? I did use the term deliberately, and it is the term being used, and you got it correctly. That means that you adapt to something that happened. So therefore, that is what you do at the back end. If it happened to you, you adapt to it. The term that, that covers the other aspect is if you, if you focus here and you create the, the, the adaptation side of things, which is still the term being used, you can actually split it in two. And the, the, uh, the active part of this is called climate proofing. And this morning, it was in the international press that Vietnam has come to realize that they have 3,000 kilometers of coastline that is so low, so if the seas, they go one meter, it will hurt them very badly. What they do now is climate proofing. First, they understand it's wrong. And then, of course, what they do is they start finding out, what the hell do I do? So they're calling the Dutch, because what is it that the Dutch are good at? building dikes, okay? That's what you have to do. So it's a little, but this is, this is an example of climate proofing, but you see it many, many places. You see buildings, standards are being changed. So, uh, so buildings are being lifted. You see uh, zoning being changed. So certain areas you can no longer build this way or do that way. There's a lot of climate proofing happening. And this is at the same time when some politicians are still discussing that this is not happening at all. But I have to tell you, at the professional level, it is happening a lot. The problem is only, where is it happening? In Western Europe. Is it happening in Ukraine? No. Okay. So, following your argument, what happens then? That, you, of course, Ukraine will... As we couldn't do much climate proofing, we will have to adapt. And what do you think is the most expensive? Doing the proofing or do the adaptation? Of course. Yeah. So this again, I'm, I'm trying to get back to this issue that, that if we focus too much from a human development point of view on the short-term economic crisis, we are getting, especially the vulnerable groups that is of our primary concern, they will be hit by the climate change or the climate crisis very, very hard. And therefore, we, in a sense, what, I, what we're trying to do and trying to argue is, is the following. If you'll just bear with me. And that means if you see the future as some kind of a low carbon, this is where you want to be. You want to move your economy to a low carbon economy. You don't want to build back. And if I am to help any person with public money, I'd much rather put you in a job that brings you to a low carbon economy, gives you a skill set to understand it, get you involved with the private sector. Maybe I hire you through a little company. That company then gets on getting on their books. I know how to install windows. I know how to do solar panels. I know how to do this stuff here. Because this is the future. 
there's one piece of information I'm not shared with you is that this region here has world record in carbon over GDP. These are the most carbon intensive economies. Not all of them, but some of them. We're still having a debate whether Ukraine or Uzbekistan takes the price, but I think Uzbekistan is the one. What do you believe the role will be of countries like the United States, China, India, Brazil, Russia, in Copenhagen in terms of going forward with the suggestions that you offer? And the second question is, um, you had mentioned that um, um, the word just escaped me, subsidies are perpetuating the problem, but I'm wondering if it's possible to look at it more narrowly and to look at whether providing subsidies across energy industries is maybe a more, uh, a, a different way of approaching it. In other words, that we don't just subsidize oil and gas industries, but we subsidize now energy producing industries in order to put them on, on more equal footing with uh, well-established energy industries. I should say that I, I can speak more comfortably on to the uh, climate change negotiation point. I can speak to the subsidy point, but I'm not a professional economist, and therefore there, there are limits to how far I can take that argument. Um, in your question sits some very important observations, with, and I agree with them. Whatever China, the United States, and EU agree is what's going to be agreed in Copenhagen. It makes it simpler, but it's a sad story when you think about democracy on the earth. But it is true. The big economies, if they decide, they decide. I'm probably much more optimistic than many, and this is because the following. We do interact, also my job, with China. And the Chinese, they look at the energy consumption per inhabitant, even in the poor countries in Europe. And they put it in a spreadsheet, and then they times it with 1.5 billion. And then they get very fast to the conclusion, there's no way, there's no way that they can get to some kind of strong GDP based on brown economy. There's simply not enough gas, oil, and coal in the world to do that. Or rather, they do have a lot of coal, but they find out they have to burn so much of it, so even now they understand from a pollution point of view it's a non-start. So the Chinese probably intellectually more than any other nation in the world has understood that where we are going, we cannot go. Much, much, much stronger than what I see in Western Europe and the United States. Much stronger. We have much more denial which is ideological based in these two countries. And it's very interesting interacting with ideology because then when you talk to people more about substantiating, they come back to you and say, you cannot prove that the world will go to hell. And I said that is correct. Uh, but then we get into this non-action kind of thing. The Chinese understand that they, they don't, they don't it's not the climate crisis per se. It is simply that a very energy intensive GDP is not available to them as a, as a development model. So intellectually, they are much more glued on to this kind of agenda. Does that mean that they were going to make a deal with the US in Copenhagen? Not necessarily, because the Chinese, they can wait a little bit. And if they think they better get a better deal a year later, they may wait. But from a long-term tactical perspective or strategic perspective, the Chinese, in, in my view, is the only country in the world that have understood that the current way of doing business is not in their interest. Okay? Then the US has changed recently, and therefore I think what we will get to is a, a mix. You will get to some kind of a compromise in Copenhagen that will look along the following lines, and then I'll bring it to the jobs. It will look like an agreement to that climate change is for real, and we have to do something. It will be an agreement that CO2 emissions have to be curbed. There will be an agreement even for some of the principles, and I think they will stick to what's called cap and trade. But then, interestingly enough, I do think you are going to see a couple of taxes. And that brings me back to how I answered you. Those taxes will be used not so much 
to curb CO2, but more to finance what needs to get done. And that means that we are going to see international taxes at a level we have never seen before. And for the, 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 the nation that will fight them the most is going to be the US. But nevertheless, this is where I think it will be. It will be from those sources upon we can do some of the interventions, I argue. On the issue of subsidies, the problem with subsidies if you follow your line of thinking, which I understood to be, well, one thing is subsidizing coal or, or, or brown energy. But what you could do is you could also subsidize renewable energy, like windmills, which is de facto what has been done, going on. The problem with that argument is that the minute that you subsidize something, people tend to use more of it. Okay? So, so, so the drill is maybe instead of subsidizing it's better to get the price of brown energy right. That means by insisting that it has externalities. And then factor those into the price. And then focus a lot on your energy efficiency, which is what I'm arguing with the green jobs. You know, before you subsidize power to heat your house, make sure that your house is well insulated. This is roughly how the argument goes. But I do agree that if you are sure, as you have seen, in, in, especially in Western Europe, where you cannot do that much more in the housing sector, then I do agree with you. At that point in time, maybe it's a good idea to subsidize. There's one other version of that argument. And that is how we are bringing it back to human development. And this is this. If you are to use public money to create green jobs, now we move into renewable energy. It does, it, 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 from a spatial point of view, it actually matters where you do it. So, this is a country. I don't know which one it is. What does it look like? Okay. Here's a power plant. This power plant here is very good. Now, here's a citizen. He's called Jens, which is me. He lives 300 kilometers from the power plant. In most countries, what price do I pay for a kilowatt there? I pay the same price as I pay there. Is that right? In your country, is that so? If you're far away from the electricity or you're close, you still pay the same in the electricity. It's the same. But for the real economy, it's not the same. For the real economy, it's not the same. There is minus 40% loss here on 300 kilometers line. So therefore, if you do renewable, what you do is you give Jens a solar panel. Okay? Here is a guy, he's called Andre. He lives right next to the power plant, okay? You don't give the solar panel to Andre. You give it to Jens. Because if you give it to Jens, it may be that against this price here, this price where, where somebody compares it with a diesel generator and then he, he gets a loan from his children and my children. If you compare it with that price, you need to subsidize it. But because this is a real loss to the economy, there may at the end of the day really not be a subsidy. We don't know for sure because we haven't done the full economics, but we know this is the case. And certainly, is any of you coming from Uzbekistan, for example? Please. In up in Kal Kal Pakistan, there, there, the, uh, there's, there are areas where there's no access to electricity, and it costs ten thousand dollars per kilometer. So therefore, if you suddenly don't have access, the last, in this case, the one place they have to, they have to build seventy kilometers of grid. That is seven hundred thousand. No, it's more. No, seven hundred thousand dollars just there. And therefore, it's, it's a very good business to just try to invest in electricity production up there and then wait with the grid. So you, you could do grid replacement, you can defer building grids. So you can play with the economics. And if you do that, some of this energy, if you build it on the margin, some of that energy technically will be subsidized because the price is wrong. But from, a, from an economic point of view in that country, if that loss had been factored in correctly in the grid, then there's no loss. Sorry, there's no subsidy. Follow me? Well, just 
isn't part of your discussion in uh, not just renewable jobs or renewable energy, but local energy and trying to move folks as far off the grid or needing to recreate grids um, that then maybe have that on a smaller scale, but still have those connections between that where you have your source of energy distant from the need. It's, you're, you're correct. That if I only had $1 million to do this, I will move them up on the margin on the grid. That's where the return will be the biggest. But I don't want to take that argument too far because pockets of unemployment, I mean, real human development decline, they can sit in many places. I was most recently in Ukraine, and I can see these cities that depend on very big factories. So wherever it is, we, we can go in. I still think the green jobs can have a very positive impact. But on the margin, if I only had a million dollars, I will start from a spatial point of view on the, on the edge of the grid. Because that's where the return to the economy would be the best, for sure. But ideally, you would like to fix, you know, address every single you know, person everywhere. You know, that's yes. great with how a solar panel as well, right? Not that. That, that, that is. That is I mean, let's talk about it more broad because sometimes the sun is not the right, it's the wind. But you've got the idea. No, I think that, I'm not, let me see whether we can make some progress on this one. That kind of if you could see like, if we could have some kind of saying, this is coverage here. And then you do like this. And then you make a split here. And this is privately financed. And this is public. As long as the price is like this, you will have difficulties in getting up in this private space, but you can. It is possible. And then what you do is you kind of move your way up this way. And at a given time, you will cross over because the private sector will take over the financing. The minute that this price gets right, a lot of people will go to the bank and borrow and get it done themselves. And even some community-based programs that I know of people they borrow and get it done because the return via the heating bill is so good it's in ukraine they have removed the subsidy in ukraine so public buildings they have to pay the real bill so suddenly you know having your windows replaced etc gives you such a, a return in reduced energy expenditure so it's nearly a good business and then of course with a bit of subsidies you can move this down and you can create maybe a, a zone here where you do public-private partnerships. You're a little, you, know, you, do, you play a little bit with uh, uh, give some banking guarantee or maybe subsidize an interest for a period of time or things like this. So that's how we, 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 we hope to move this forward. I'll take a new, please. The concept, uh, what you taught is whole beautiful and I would really love to have it, but in a practical sense, I see that uh, if you want to make a cultural change on the thinking of the society and uh, their concepts, uh, I'm a bit skeptical how long does it take to implement this uh, concept that you make? Because, you know, politicals uh, maximize their vote on mm. the basis of the society, and as I feel it in Hungary, but in the other uh, post-socialist bloc countries as well, it is really difficult to implement these things because people would rather have a bridge uh, built and have, or rather than having environmental things because they maximize on shorter terms. And I think it's really difficult because the, we don't care for green things. We, we must have these things educated. And I feel a bit lack of this uh, cultural change impact in your concept. Uh, I can confirm to you this is my daily struggle, okay? And I can confirm to you that many people will rather have a food processing plant or a bridge over the local river than take this. But having said that, how do I argue it? Because you want it to be practical, so then in a sense I have to, when I'm successful, how do I argue it? The most successful ones we have right now is, is happening when we, we go and, and argue the energy efficiency and the reduction of the energy bill. That one works. And then the minute that public authorities understand 
that we can attract money, in this case from the Global Environmental Facility, that means external financing. They really like it. Because as politicians are maybe short-sighted, they're also short of capital. So if somebody shows up with money, you have their undivided attention. Okay, so that one works. The other one that works is that right now in the press, because Copenhagen and the whole climate change, and thanks to Al Gore and everybody else, this has suddenly moved from nowhere to somewhere. And, uh, and, and here I'm now talking about the senior political level. Let me give you a real example. I don't know whether anybody here is from Bosnia Herzegovina. I was meeting with the Minister of Finance in, in that country, and I said to him that we were discussing the crisis, and he was kind of admitting he had a crisis, although, you know, when people, politicians are close to elections, they don't have a crisis. So, uh, so they were playing a bit with that. But he kind of admitted he had a crisis. But then I said to him, it's very important for your country to maximize the external inflows to your country, and he agreed. I said, why is it that you do not have what is called a designated national authority? This is the authority that certifies when you do green jobs that you can get your carbon things. And then he looked at me, he said, I actually do not know. And there you see another gap. If I ask Minister of Environment, of course she would know. But this guy here, nobody had talked to him about the environment this way, practically like tomorrow morning. So you can see slowly, 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 it's moving from being the job of the Ministry of Environment and a bunch of left-wing people, it has moved in to become mainstream. So compared to two years ago, my job today is much easier. And that means from a politician's point of view, I meet more and more politicians where I'm kicking in open doors. That means once they understand it, they buy it. My biggest problem is to explain to them carbon sale and things like this. Because they, that they don't get. That they don't. And let me use that as a, as a gay segue to the following argument. You remember these green jobs, we can do windows kind of thing. What we have found out is the following, that if you have a lot of houses and you do windows, that's good. We can maybe get some financing underneath it. We can save something on the heating bill. And this is a great thing. But we come to find out that if you take a much smaller group of houses and you don't only do the windows, but you do the walls, you do the roof, you do the piping, you do everything, what happens is then that you can get up to very large savings, something like 50% or even above in your energy bill, which is very big. And then if you take, and I can give you a real figure, if you take 150 building blocks in former Soviet Union country, it may not be true for Hungary, but in a, for, in a standard, they have uh, you know, four floors, and if you take 150 building blocks and you, only, and you do them with everything, apart from the return on the energy bill, we can actually measure the carbon that has been saved and we can sell that carbon. And that means that suddenly you can create a new revenue stream that you can invest in this that didn't exist before. So that means a variation over the green job theme is that if you can concentrate it on, an, on a limited number of buildings and, and create a huge saving, this way you can get money from the market and then reinforce your revenue stream. And I think this one here is going to be my winner. So that means this is the one that will sway your politicians, even in Hungary. If I could sell it to them, I can't because Hungary is an EU member. But, uh, but that is the winning formula, because who, will, who would go against this? Okay. We're not there yet, but this is where the thinking is. Please. If I can make an addition to Jens in terms of making, uh, making positive change in climate mitigation with just ordinary people. Jens talked about working with politicians, but it's not just politicians, it's every day, it's, it's us, all of us. Uh, I can speak from our example, for instance, in regard to the solar panels. For instance, uh, when it's uh, cold, uh, people chop down trees. They burn it and they use it as fire. The next year when spring comes, there's no fruits, there's no uh, real source of uh, wine uh, in terms of uh, 
that trees help the environment to they use these fruits to sell it and generate income three it's their own food they eat it themselves but when you work with the solar power energy it uh, creates heating for the house for the winter uh, the sun is free it's just there you have to take it again in terms of subsidies working with development agencies and just uh, in uh, outreach and advocacy with the communities themselves. It's like professional leverage. You have to go out there in the field and, and talk about it. Because if you have that approach that you doubt that people understand it or want to uh, have give their children a safe future in, in terms of long term, it goes down. But you have to keep it up and you have to work on it, not only yourself, but you have to uh, share your knowledge and the inspiration with people around. And that's how you get to the point where you know, we have safe carbon emissions. Thanks. We can be talking about what we have to do, and you know, you just explain kind of like, you know, I, yeah, but I mean, um, we can be talking about what we have to do and what needs to be done and what should be done, but when you actually get to the bottom line of actually doing them, and you know, selling your ideas, and you know, having people not just talk about you know um, saving energy, mm -hmm. but uh, um, I don't know, turning off water when you wash your dishes. Mm -hmm. Do you do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's. I mean, yes, no, but generally speaking, you know, it's hard. I mean, again, it's really. Um, um, I mean, it's easier to talk. I mean, teach what you preach, preach what you teach, but it's easier to talk about things than actually do them. And um, um, I just um, was trying to kind of project all those, you know, scenarios and uh, going to the banks and borrowing money, you know, to proof your houses or apartments and installing new windows. Actually, about windows, not all of them are environmentally friendly, so That's we correct. can talk about that too. That's but. Right. Um, but uh, I was trying to project that situation on Russia, mm -hmm. and I had a really hard time. I don't know what your experience have been has been uh, with, uh, if you had any, mm -hmm. with you know, but with um, about the Russian politicians, and maybe you could talk no, a little bit. I can give you a real story. But I, uh, I can give you a real story. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. But um, I was really not seeing a list you know, in the next three, five years, those scenarios actually unfolding within the Russian context. Unfortunately, and hopefully, you know, in other countries in the region, it's different. And I do believe in the contextual, you know, um, importance because, you know, in every country there will be similarities and there will be differences. But um, I don't know, do you have, uh, that's why, you know, it's kind of, I wanted to ask if you, again, based on your experience, if mm -hmm. you have any, uh, practical advice okay. for working with uh, Russian politicians and Russian governmental officials because this is something that I have to do in my region um, concerning educating people about sustainability mm -hmm. issues um, and it's just not going anywhere. I work for UNDP. We have 60 million dollars energy efficiency projects on the portfolio today in the region and we are growing. Some of the best one we're doing in Russia. And let me explain how it came about. No, no, because it, I can, there are a couple of tricks in the trade. Number one is we were very, very careful in selecting our counterpart. And probably our best project, I'll explain to you in a very few minutes, is an is a insulation and energy efficiency project in schools. And how it happened was that we did not find a politician, but we found one of the professionals in the education department in Moscow. And he in that case sponsored it. And then immediately we went to the regions. So there are two tricks there. Find a non-political sponsor. And number two, get the hell out of the capital. And this goes actually for many things we do. If you go to the lower levels, it is much easier to work with people because they are people are more responsive. Democracy or no response or democracy, they are more responsive to the real situation. And this school project is wonderful because it does two things. It, it insulates the schools, but the trick was to go to the local authorities and this education department senior civil servant, and then have the budget system changed. So if a school actually paid less energy bill next year, they could keep the money. So that was very important, manipulate with the underlying financing. And number two was, they did something that, that was very human, but not so obvious. 
I don't know with you, but when I was small and some people were doing big construction work, of course you would all be there looking at it like this, okay? So therefore, what do children do in school? Level, local, local. So they brought in teachers who taught the children energy efficiency. And of course the children were very motivated. And, and then when the evaluation came around, they found out that the children, what, what do you think they went home and said, told their mom? Switch the light off. So suddenly came this idea that the children were actually by far the best ambassadors to get to their parents because they really got it and they start nagging the parents. So there, and that was an on, nobody had thought of that impact, but it really happened. The other big project we're doing in Russia right now, which is close to this, is light exchange. There's a lot of waste that's sitting in lightning. And the quality of modern bulbs, et cetera, is, has now reached a level where it becomes interesting. So we do two things. We do some pilots, and then we help Russian manufacturing to change and produce low energy bulbs of a good quality. So that worked with the politicians, because in a sense, some politicians do see that industrial change out there. And if they can come in, and they see that you're willing to change their structural aspects, they go with it. Are there many of those? No. That is true. And, and I'm even astounded when I go around and talk to quite senior people. There is a generational issue here, <laughs> we just have to say it. And, the, and then there's also there's a kind of an issue of, can it really be so? And this is, the fundamental is that most people cannot handle this issue of stock and flow. Most people cannot really understand mentally that we have been filling CO2 on the universe or, the, or on the Earth, and the Earth cannot take much more. But we have been filling it for 100 years. So, so, so the fact that it's the last five centimeters in the bathtub that makes it flow over, that picture is not so clear in many people's head. So they kind of say, it won't happen in my time. Okay? Which is true. That's why I put this one down. It's actually most, most, most of present day's politicians, and especially those who made the mistakes in the 70s and the 80s, they simply borrowed from their next generation. That's what they did. And they will come to realize that that's the truth. I'd like to close out, please. No, it's okay. We'd, yeah, of course. What is, I wonder what is next? I mean, uh, the, is there any kind of uh, um, legal frame, framework going to be applied to, uh, uh, for, for all countries to be used uh, for, I mean, the calculation? Or is there any scientific approach to be done, is to, supposed to be done? Um, in your opinion, mm -hmm. uh, what we should do next? I should highlight three or four things. First and foremost, there's no crisis that is so bad so it's not good for something. Okay? And this crisis is so bad, so governments do not have revenues. Even my friend, in, who's not my friend by the way, but even a gentleman who runs Venezuela, he doesn't have enough money. What happened in practice is governments can no longer afford the subsidy. So they are start cutting it down, which they should. Number two is, I do think out of Copenhagen, maybe not in December, but in the 24 months following Copenhagen, there will be some physical agreements. Copenhagen will say, let's put a tax on, 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 on shipping energy. But you know, for saying that to implement it, it will take some time. But it will be implemented within a relative short period of time. And that tax is for real. That means that, that it will be binding. And I think that what you will see, countries that don't want to play by the rules, they'll get hurt by, not only by certain sanctions, but they will be denied certain access to certain sources of fund. So I think that side is going to, and that is going to raise the price of energy. Then the other thing is, brown energy is finite. One of the biggest producers in Europe is Norway. They run out in 2000, 2032, I think. Holland used to be a very big producer of gas. They are more or less out today. My own country is not a big producer, I'm Danish, but they will run out in 2025. I think the only countries that have really big reserves are like Saudi Arabia and a few others. A lot of countries are running out. And right now, how is the energy production going in Russia? Down. 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 It's going down. They have reserves, but they're not investing. So therefore, I feel very comfortable when I say, I can predict the price of energy will go up. Okay, very comfortable. 
there will be huge pressure on coal also and other things. So people will have to introduce new technologies. And that means that this loan here will be less. They will either be asked to put the car capture the carbon or they will be asked to plant trees or do something. So brown energy, number one, the price is going up for various factors. Number two, there's not enough brown energy in the world so the Chinese can get anywhere with their 1.5 billion people. So they'll go and find, and the Indians are right behind them. So they'll go and find another way of doing it. And thirdly, any country that cannot produce low carbon is not part of the global competition 20 years from today. And that I'll be very comfortable predicting. So that means we'll have a new class of underdeveloped countries, and these are the energy intensive countries. And unfortunately, certain segments of countries that sit in our region are in great danger of going there. I don't know if any one of you know, but Argentina in the mid 30s was richer than the UK. In terms of GDP. So you can comfortably take a country and destroy its future. It is totally possible. So this idea that, that, that a certain country today has some kind of history of being risk, rich, if a country today cannot get itself on a low carbon trajectory, it will go out in some kind of development wilderness. So let me close out by saying, with a lot of restrictions to the argument, I do think that in the period 2009 to 2015, a part of the response and a part of the way we should build back the economies in our region from the current economic crisis is, among other things, a big investment in what is called green jobs. The argument is it's good for the people, it's good for human development, and it sets the country to a trajectory towards a low-carbon economy. And for those of you who have studied management, it says in the beginning these kind of self-help advices. It always says, if you want to be a good manager, start with the end in mind. If the end is a low carbon economy, you build back from it right now and go in that direction instead of just trying to build back to something else. So on that note, let me finish and thank you very much for your attention.